Welcome to the National Day edition of ISO Plaza Series 4, organized by Integrated Sustainability and Urban Creativity Center from Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation, APU. I'm your host, as well as the moderator of today's roundtable panel discussion, Stephen Poon. We are here at the broadcast, pleased to welcome our online audience who has just joined us from around the regions in the moment. I will introduce the panelists of our virtual session simultaneously. You can also use the Q&A function to submit your question to our speakers. Good evening to all from this region and good day to the international audience. The distinguished panels, indeed, to our online audience from different parts of the region. May I say welcome once again to the National Day edition of ISO Plaza Series 4 for the theme panel discussion of managing supply chain sustainability reassures the challenges when achieving green credentials. We have a very diverse panel with the different experiences, with also a very diverse expertise. And I'm sure, like me, all of you are looking forward to hear the views from all of them. Now we have three panelists excluding me, and I want to make sure that we get to hear from each of them. A quick background of the, of the discussion today. In recent years, the natural environment becomes a major global issue due to increasing human and industry impacts on the environment. Environmental issues become more intense and widespread. In this regard, businesses need to place equal footing both on the environment and on their business objectives. However, firms with large supplier base are found to be significantly higher in green purchasing and eco design than firms with lower supplier base. Green supply chain initiative can play a significant role in achieving the triple bottom line of social, environmental, economic benefits, and therefore contributing to the sustainable development of the society. 
Before we kick off the session, I would like to bring everybody through the first panel of the topic driven by current climate change discussion. Many companies find themselves facing increased pressure from customers to do business in an environmentally responsible manner. The research findings indicate that a lean environment serves as a catalyst to facilitate green supply chain operations. The integration of lean and green practices will bring benefits to companies. In other words, adoption of lean creates substantial opportunity for adoption of green operation strategies since both draw upon the same underlying principles, a dedication to waste reduction, productivity improvement, cost reduction, and energy savings. This evening, I would like to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Tang Kim Hua is a professor of operation and innovation management in the UK Nottingham University Business School. He is also associate dean in research and knowledge exchange of Nottingham University Business School UK. Professor Tan is a senior fellow of UK Higher Education Academy HEA, a fellow of JSPS, the Japan Society for the Promotional, sorry, uh, the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science and world-class professorship at ITS, Institute Technology Sepulo, November of Surabaya, Indonesia. Prior to this, he was a research fellow and teaching assistant at Center for Strategy and Performance, University of Cambridge. Professor Tan spent many years in industry, holding various executive positions before joining Academia, uh, Academia in uh, uh, 1999. His current research interests are accelerated innovation, lean management, operation strategy, sustainable operation, and supply chain management. He has spoken on this subject across the global, including China, Taiwan, Japan, Latin America, Europe, and other locales. Professor Tan has consulted many Fortune 500 companies and appointed as our Common Future Fellow by the Volkswagen Foundation in 2009. Please welcome Professor Tang Kin Hua. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, let me uh, share my slide. Right, uh, good afternoon. And uh, as a Malaysian, it's my great honor uh, to be uh, invited uh, to take part in this uh, APU uh, National Day edition of uh, Sustainable Supply Chain Roundtable. Right. The topic of my uh, discussion today is uh, using lean practices as a catalyst for green supply chain. Before I move on, uh, let me uh, briefly uh, explain to you about my research uh, background and also uh, the background of this uh, study. I'm a uh, so-called action researcher. Uh, more specifically, I specialize in uh, process-based uh, action research. So basically, I uh, work with the uh, companies or, or managers uh, to address their supply chain or operation concern. But not as a consultant, because consultant aim is uh, to make money. But as an academic, this means uh, to generate new knowledge. Okay. So my uh, research uh, interest, uh, I share with you some of my recent uh, uh, research projects. Uh, for example, on the transformative uh, innovation model. So basically, to work with the companies, yeah, to help them to boost their innovation uh, performance. So for example. Uh, I'm going to show two examples here, yeah, and you can see here it's a leveling tool, right? This is a kind of very low value commodity product. So in the transform uh, transformative model, we help the firm, yeah, to transform it into a highly uh, value added destructive product. Okay, that can be uh, a market uh, internationally. Okay, so example here from a kind of a conventional barber-based digital tool become a digital tool, 
yeah, uh, digitalized leveling tool, and then the, the with high precision to assist three assist uh, high precision leveling tool that can be used in the aerospace industry and others industry that need highly precision uh, leveling tool. Yeah, so all this will be carried out in the short period of time uh, with the uh, uh, and limited uh, resources. Okay, and another example is a uh, face mask. Okay, the disposable face mask. Yeah, from a kind of a conventional face mask to an intelligent uh, face mask. Okay, that are able to amplify your volume, uh, translate the, uh, the languages and, and so on. So in the future, you can imagine, yeah, uh, everywhere you go, you need to hold two items. One is your smartphone and the other one is the intelligent face mask. Okay, so this is an example of what we call the process-based uh, action research. We work with company, yeah, Help them to address uh, their concern, yeah, and then uh, and uh, transform them into a, a kind of a highly value added uh, uh, innovative products. Another research uh, project I'm working on is on the sustainable supply chain, especially uh, utilizing a uh, blockchain uh, to achieve uh, supply chain transparency. I believe you all have this uh, experience if you go to a, a Tesco or, for example, Giant in Malaysia. If you buy a mango or a, a Musang King Durian, right? I mean, in the past, you may just buy the product and, uh, and, and pay, you know, you, you just concerned about how much it costs you. Yeah. But today, everyone, you and I, yeah, we want to play our part in, in, in the society. Yeah, we want to take company responsible, uh, you know, for this uh, sustainable environment. Yeah, so when you look at the mango or the Musang King Durian, you ask the question, yeah, where it come from, yeah. which durian farmer yeah, has the Tesco or, or Giant, you know, I pay them well. Yeah. And uh, we, you, we also focus on the sustainability, not just about the environment, but also corporate social responsibility, because that is part of the sustainable supply chain as well. So you want to know, is that, uh, uh, how about the EDI, yeah? uh, equality? Is the supply chain, the food supply chain, the durian supply chain employ equal amount of uh, male and female workers? Yeah, we also want to know about inclusivity. Yeah, uh, and so on. So these are the things uh, consumers like you and I, uh, we want to play our part. Yeah, so for firms, the sustainable supply chain uh, using blockchain is important for them to achieve that. Yeah, so at the moment, I look, I'm working on the project for a retailer in Nottingham. Yeah, for this uh, blockchain supply chain yeah, uh, for the hot paper all the way from Uganda uh, to UK to Nottingham. The other area of my research is on the lean karakuri. So basically, automation uh, without external power. So as you know, today we talk about Industry 4.0, yeah, and automation has become a norm in, in the operations. Yeah, but robot or, 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 or automation cost you money and you need external power to drive the automation right with lean karakuri you can achieve automation without external power yeah so this is a kind of a something that can help firm to achieve uh, the net zero uh, kind of a target uh, in the future yeah so this is a quick background about my uh, uh, research and uh, especially with this uh, lean karakuri yeah i Always uh, travel to Asia, Latin America, Europe, you know, work with many, many companies, you know, provide training to them about this lean and uh, lean karakuri and so on. And uh, in the process, I also come across managers and the CEO, they concerned about this uh, um, uh, issue about this sustainable supply chain yeah, because they have to meet a certain target, the carbon footprint, net zero uh, target and so on and so forth. Yeah. So they, by providing training to them, they talk about you know the difficulties or how to balance you know this uh, 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 green operation at the same time competitive advantage, yeah. Because to them, green mean money. It cost them money. Okay, they, they worry about how to do it more cost effectively. Yeah. So if they play uh, by the rules, what happened if their competitors in other country they don't play by the rules? Okay, uh, they do the what we call the green washing. They say, oh, we are green, but in fact, they're not doing it. So they are, then their cost base is going to be lower. So if you try to play the, by the book, 
yeah, and then your is you are very green, but your cost is very high, so you're not competitive enough to compete with other competitors and so on. So these are the challenges uh, challenges they face. As a dean practitioners, then I I I were talking to many many of these managers about this concern. One day this kind of mingo bingo kind of a moment came. I said, look, we talk about green. Most people associate that with additional cost, yeah, but a lot of managers are willing to spend money, yeah, engaging me, yeah, to train them about green, because they see that's no, right about lean, because they see lean actually save money, but as a lean practitioner, uh, practitioners, I know that lean is all about reducing waste, reducing pollution, and so on. So lean and green actually is complementary, yeah. So the mingo kind of a moment came. So why don't Manager approach it from a different angle. Instead of seeing green, yeah, as a kind of uh, going to cost them money, why don't we just sort of uh, change their mindset? So instead of uh, uh, go head on on the green, why don't you do lean first? Yeah, because lean and green is complementary. And by doing lean first, uh, uh, and it's also easier for company to accept because it to, their mindset is that lean is going to save them money in the long term. Yeah, but lean and green is complementary. Yeah, by practicing lean, you can cultivate the kind of uh, behavior or mindset, yeah, in a company. Yeah, and then that will help uh, in the long term for company to achieve a green operation. Okay, so instead of uh, try to Mickey Mouse uh, with this uh, kind of a uh, 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 green operation, a sort of a uh, uh, green washing, you can see a lot of company uh, in their website. You know they do video you know how green they are and so on and so forth but in the actual practice they are not green yeah they just want to show something to show they are green and so on why don't they just adopt lean as the foundation as a practice because lean itself help them to save money but in the long term easier for them to trans uh, for transition to achieve green supply chain okay and uh, i'm not going to show any video here but if you have time uh, please look at this and uh, Masaki Imai is one of the leading guru on lean, yeah. And he also uh, agreed that lean and green is highly complementary. Yeah, you also can look at his uh, book on uh, Gemba Kaisan. And one of the key principles of lean is that uh, value. Yeah, you always look at the value from the customer point of view. And here is a good example. If you buy a laptop, for example, a HP laptop or an Apple uh, laptop, what is value to you? Is it the packaging or the laptop? Yeah, for most of us, of course, it's a laptop. This is more important to us, right? So a good example here is a HP looking from the customer point of view using lean perspective. Yeah, so what customer want is a laptop. So the packaging is something that sometimes they have to worry or sometimes they, they have to think about how to dispose, right? So why don't you, from that lean point of view, the value point of view, yeah, you make the packaging as a carrying bag because that itself also enables you to uh, put more a laptop yeah, in, in the shipment, at the same time, the packaging itself is value added for the customer. So this is just an example. Yeah, Another good example is uh, the recent uh, Tokyo Olympic, right? So what, as, as uh, Olympians, what do you want? You want is the gold medal or the silver medal or bronze medal, right? This is what you want. You do want waste, okay? <laughs> From the customer point of view, the medal is what they want. Yeah, so you can actually transform all those uh, waste yeah into a matter that is value added to the customer yeah the point i want to make here is the uh, lean yeah help you to achieve green from the source it's actually from the design stage all the way not at the at the end of the point stage okay so it's a kind of a, a full package for company uh, to embark on the green journey yeah of, of course there are issues with uh, some of the the quality and so on but this is not a discussion today and uh, there's another video here, example for you to look at uh, on this uh, quite a, a big company from the US, uh, Acrofab, yeah, where they in integrate lean and green in the operation and they achieve substantial uh, benefits and also help them to, uh, to become one of the leading uh, green supplier for many, many uh, uh, multinational companies. Yeah. So you can see uh, the foundation of the lean actually is a uh, uh, complementary with the uh, green, yeah, reduce inventory that uh, that could lead to reduce waste, overproduction, 
to energy, energy usage, transportation to CO2 emission and so on. So the message I want to emphasize here is that uh, lean and green is highly complementary and especially lean serve as a kind of foundation uh, to uh, cultivate the kind of uh, mindset and behavior that enable company to achieve green operation uh, in the long term. Okay. And uh, I want to share with you another example before uh, uh, I go is the, this uh, Karakuri I mentioned before. Okay. Automation is very important for many manufacturing uh, warehouses and so on, right? But automation costs you money and you need excellent power that will uh, generate carbon footprint and so on and so forth. Yeah. But you can use lean Karakuri, right? You utilize this kind of uh, principles like gravity, uh, magnetic force, balance, uh, friction, spring, and so on, which is easy to make and uh, to achieve automation. Yeah. So here is an example, uh, I work with a leading Karakuri expert in, uh, in Asia, uh, so that we can introduce this uh, uh, lean Karakuri uh, in, uh, in different uh, Asia region. Okay. So the benefit of this uh, lean Karakuri is that uh, it can uh, help company to achieve sustainable operation, you know, by reducing CO2 emission and energy consumption. But more importantly, at the same time, enable you to tick the EDI boxes. Yeah, because having a uh, Karakuri uh, automation, then you, you can make your process more inclusive. You can engage, for example, you know, more aging workers, yeah, more women, because now they can just press a button, yeah, instead of having to, to carry uh, the heavy workload of, of the of, of the component, they can use a Karakuri compo uh, a mechanism to do the work. So you can engage more women in the process. So you can achieve better EDI, which is the best, very really important element of sustainable supply chain. Okay. So because the I only have twenty minutes, yeah. So the, to 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 sum up, Lean has a crucial, you know, public good spillover. So basically, uh, it's a very highly complementary with green. So both because the underlying principles, waste and pollution uh, deduction. Yeah. And this gain will be achieved by source deduction, as I mentioned just now, and also the example I've given just now, not end of pipe prescription. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's totally complementary from the beginning, from the new product development uh, until uh, the customer stage. Okay. And uh, if this talk about lean and green uh, get you excited and you want to know more uh, about this area, and uh, here are some of the relevant uh, uh, papers you can look into. Yeah, I've written the first paper in 2013, and this is one of the most cited uh, uh, lean and green paper uh, in literature. And, and more recently, you can see that I've been uh, engaging with a researcher in uh, Brazil, Japan, yeah, to introduce this lean and green uh, uh, for SMB in, uh, uh, in, in Brazil and in, in Japan. Okay. That's all for today. And uh, uh, thank you very much. And then uh, I, I wish you a happy Manika day. The hesitations towards the implementation of green practices is fueled by the fact that there is confusion about what green actually is. And there are only a few, very few independent models of regulation or best practices in place that support the implementation, not to mention the worries about greening supply chain is a costly exercise. As such, the continuous drive of zero defects and manufacture what is needed when it is needed to produce spillover benefit to the environment and creates the context for create for creative solution to emission reduction, the pollution prevention, leading consecutively toward net zero supply chain. Thank you, Professor Tang Kin Hua. Coming up, our second panelist, Ms. Oi Lei Peng, is the CEO of Brajaya Pack. Since 2015, she has been transforming Bajaya Pack from a traditional wooden pallet family business into an integrated industry packaging solution company serving multinational corporations globally. 
Unafraid to forge new paths, she has increased the company's global footprint by rapidly establishing locations across Malaysia and overseas serving multinational customers. As a woman entrepreneur, she has been honored to receive these prominent awards. EY Woman Entrepreneur of the Year 2021 Malaysia, 2019 the Penang Top Achievers Masterclass Woman Achiever of the Year, 2018 Star Outstanding Business Awards Female Entrepreneur of the Year Par Excellent Achievement. Under her stellar, stellar, uh, stellar leadership, Pujaya Pak has been sweeping prestigious awards annually. Sustainability uh, Business Awards by Global Initiative winner in, such, uh, in Supply Chain Management 2021. Asia Corporate Excellence and Sustainability Asia Leading SME 2020, Penang Top Achiever Industry Excellence in Packaging 2019, Golden Bull Award Outstanding SME 2018, Malaysia Productivity Corporation Lean Management Silver Category 2017, Malaysia Timber Industry Board Lean Champion in Lean Create Nova Program 2017, and the last SME Top 100 Awards, Fast Moving Company 2017. Lei Ping's topic focus on modern global supply chain is complex and fragile and are easily disrupted from trade and military wars, as well as health pandemics. Adjustment to plans and strategies within an organization is inevitable to ensure businesses remain sustainable, green, and profitable. It is important for collaboration among the supply chain players and the implementation of, uh, of sustainable business best practices to be accelerated. For businesses to be sustainable, they need to adopt circular economy principle in order to manage current global headwinds and challenges. Example of this initiative will be discussed to showcase how they capture value through growth and return on capital. Here we are. Please welcome Ms. Oi Lei Ping. Thank you, Dr. King. Uh, thank you, Dr. Um, Stephen, for the kind uh, introduction on me. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Kim Tan, for your sharing. It was, I, I enjoy your sharing very much, and I can even identify some of the points you're talking. So, um, Jerry, please bring in my slides. So today, my presentation is about managing risk and creating value to achieve sustainability in supply chain. Let's dive into what is sustainability. So if you were to look up to a dictionary, uh, su sustainability is actually talking about, there are, there are a few dimensions on sustainability. So let's look into the definition. The first definition talking about the ability to maintain a certain rate or level. For example, sustainability of economic growth. This one, we are talking about company growth. The second definition is avoidance of the depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance. This, we are talking about pursuit of global environmental sustainability. So we are looking at sustainability in totality. Number one is for company to survive, to make profit, to to continue on, and number two is to put the protection of the environment. So when we talk about how to sustain a business, we are actually talking about continuity in the business. So business continuity planning become very important. So in short, I call this BCP. So what is BCP? A BCP is a system of prevention and recovery from potential threats to a company. It involves defining risks that can affect the company's operation, making it an important part of the organization's risk management strategy. Allow me to pause for a while. So when I started Bajapak seven years ago, I came into a business, start all over again for this company. So when I look at this company, I look at the company, where can I start? There are a lot of flaws in the company to be begin with. We have raw materials. We have a lot of wastage. Technology-wise, we are behind. 
and we don't have enough talent to develop the company. Financial capability was weak. We don't have enough network and organization structure was not even straightened up. So these were the threats that I recognized in the beginning of the business. And from that threats, so I listed down all the threats and start working on it. When we look into the, a company, we look into the company as how it operates. We also look into the industry the company falls into and the total economy that the company is operating in. So the next thing is organization structure is very important. It needs to reflect hierarchy, authority and duty during emergency situations, as well as identify potential disruptions and establishing plans to keep the scenario manageable. So one have to have the mindset to look beyond today's threat and what is coming tomorrow. And we need to draw up a crisis communication strategy to put in place to ensure there is no communication back, uh, breakdown. So during the pandemic happened in 2020 and 2021, Bajapak was fortunate that in the very beginning, we already have this BCP planning in place. It wasn't a, a, a very top-notch BCP. However, from where we start, it slowly progressed into something. In 2020, because of this BCP planning, Bajapak was not only able to survive, survive um, we actually helping a lot of company MNCs in, in Malaysia to be able to ship up their product overseas. So business continuity planning is very important to sustain a company to, to, to continuously function, even in the disruptions that you face in the economy, in the business cycle. So next, we want to talk about global environmental sustainability. So this one is talking about our environment. It mentioned, you know, avoid de depletion of our natural resources in order to maintain a balanced ecosystem and preserve natural capital for our future generations to come. And I say it many times, it is a shared goal that spans across all industry, from the upstream to the downstream of all different sectors. And we need to accelerate collaboration among the supply chain players and increase awareness of sustainable business best practice. So when I talk about this one, I look into the raw mat. Again, I come back to the raw mat that we use. It is very important that the raw mat we, that we use is environmentally friendly and it is sustainable for the future harvest so that we can continuously depend on this raw mat to supply to our customers. And we are also talking about how to make the working environment more friendly, more sustainable to the planet. So for Bajapak, we install dust collecting system. We call it silo to create a clean and safe workplace for our employees and to also prevent air pollution. We also implemented biomass boiler to conserve energy and use the energy for our heat treatment processes in the company. And that also helped to reduce CO2 emission. We also established a recycle uh, program for our customers. In that sense, we can reduce waste disposal and reduce landfill contributions. So these are only a few things that we started and we continue progress to have more program coming on board in years to come. Now, a sustainable business must achieve three Ps. I call this triple P, people, planet, and profit. And the triple Ps encompasses three dimensions of organizational performance. It talk about social, it talk about environmental, and economic or financial, which are you know, essential in measuring sustainability objectives. So when we talk about social, we are actually talking about people inside the society. When we're talking about the environment, we are talking about the planet. When we talk about economy and financial, we are talking about profit margin of the company. That is a, you know, important major aspect to keep the company go ongoing. So business achieves sustainably by you know, many initiatives. 
And all of these initiatives help companies capture value through growth and return on capital. At the social side, for all of us who live in this community and society, we, link it, we look into using sustainable products that, that is um, healthy for the environment. We look into reducing waste. We look into retaining and, and growing careers that is at company level. We also talk about saving energy, for example, um, installation of solar panel, for example, using biomass uh, uh, boiler to generate energy to heat treat our product. Uh, we also talk about, uh, in the environment uh, level, we also talk about circular economy. Then I will come back a little bit to, to elaborate more on circular economy. And at some point, we also talk about reduced pollution and CO2 emission to the environment. And we talk about R&D, how to improve our processes, reduce CO2 emission, um, reduce waste, and turn into another product to, to use in our packaging industry. And all these will contribute to economy and financial growth of the company. And at, at the end of the day, we are looking at return on capital. So what is circular economy? When I talk about you know, for company to be sustainable, its supply chain needs to adapt, uh, adopt circular um, economy principle in its operations and management by incorporating, I call it triple A supply chain concepts. So what is this triple A supply concept? It is talking about the three A's, agility, adaptability, and alignment. In at agility uh, phase, we are talking about anticipating change and adjusting accordingly to market situation. For example, when the pandemic happened, how agile is your company adjusting to pandemic threat? And adaptability, we are looking at responding to changes and efficiently utilizing technology to reduce waste and reutilization of material. So how, for example, for Bajapak to adapt to the changes. When I came in, when I see so much waste of the raw material that we use, I quickly utilizing the technology to shorten the heat treatment, to allow us to reduce the wastage on the raw mat that we use, and how fast we can adapt to it actually determine our success rate. Alignment. Alignment talks talk about collaborating with suppliers and customers to further enhance effectiveness and efficiency of the supply chain. And alignment is very important. When we talk about alignment, we talk about communication, how we are being transparent and open up to talk about what we are facing together with our customer, with our supplier. And when we talk about circular economy, it's very important to involve three stages. And it, it all begins uh, with design stage. In this um, industrial packaging uh, industry, um, you know, we, we, we produce packaging product. And to cut down the risk, we start actually in our product, we start from the design stage. In our box, crate and packing uh, business unit, 75% of our box and crate are designed by us. At this design stage, the product should be structured in a way that it can be reused, repurposed, and remanufactured. All our uh, packaging products are able to be reused, repurposed, and remanufactured to some extent. And the next stage we are talking about is the state, uh, use stage. It increases the durability of the product and material for as long as possible. So we are talking about application of the raw materials in our product so that to make the lifespan longer, so that it can have many turnarounds. Next, we talk about system stage. It, it is a interconnect. It interconnects the economy in, in a way that enables circular economy principle to take place. So for example, when we come up with a pellet recycling program, we, we, before we come up with the PRP, you know, we call it in short for pellet recycling program, we need to think of a system, how we can collect back the, the re, uh, recycled uh, uh, pallet 
so that there is a system for us to collect back. So, you know, moving on, we have other programs that are coming in. Before we implement the program, we actually go through the design, use, and the system to bring about the program to be, to be implemented. Last of my slide is talking about key enablers. So I talk about circular uh, um, economy and the activities and what are the factors that can enable us to successfully implement all those uh, initiatives? We talk about, we look into technology. For example, in Bajar Bay, uh, when we know that fumigation is bad for, for, for wood article treatment, uh, we change into heat treatment chamber where we recycle our biomass energy to create heat, to heat treat our wood article. And that will cut down the uh, uh, metal bromide usage in fumigation. And we totally eliminate uh, fumigation now in our, in our process. We talk about investment. We invest in, in um, equipment that shorten the lifespan of heat treatment from at least eight, 12 hours to 10 to 20 minutes. That is a significant improvement in uh, controlling of timing. And we talk about commitment. Commitment comes from top management. So I have to push for it. The top man management has, has to push, push the commitment sustainability concept from top to bottom. And we also look into finances. For example, if I want to invest in a piece of equipment to shorten the heat treatment cycle, are we capable of doing that? We talk about infrastructure. We talk about policy that can help us implement, that can help us implement all the things that we want in the company. So uh, with that, um, yeah, I hope my sharing today will give you some handle or some guidance in sustainability subject matters. Back to you. The principles of circular economy begin with design, according to what uh, uh, Lei Ping just mentioned, design, use, and system. At the design stage, uh, a, a product should be structured in a way so that it can be reused, repurposed, remanufactured. Just amazing, you know, those are the key, uh, which is uh, Lei Ping just mentioned. At the use stage, it, it uh, increases the durability of products and materials for as long as possible. The system stage interconnects the economy in a way that uh, enables circular economy principle to take place. Besides working on that, companies also need to look into key enablers to achieve sustainability objective in a circular economy model. Key enablers refer to technology, finance and investment, commitment from top management and government policies and infrastructure, to name a few. Um, it is these key enablers uh, that offer viable solution to support company sustainability journey and the green initiative. Thank you, Ms. Oily Ping. In furtherance of the topic, let's look at the uh, correlation of sustainability and the energy industry. As countries uh, commit to reduce their carbon emission and achieve net zero by 2050. The energy industry will need to radically change in the years to come. The numbers of clear over 70% of existing greenhouse gas, which is we call this a GHG, uh, emission comes from the energy sector about 80%. And uh, over primary uh, energy sources are currently based on the fossil fuel like coal, oil, and natural gas. The sustainability Im imperative and emphasis on ESG, environmental, social, and governance factors represent a reputational and financial risk to most existing players in the industry as well as opportunities to companies that are investing in low carbon solution along the whole energy value chain. The coming up topic will cover how the energy industry is changing, 
what strategies existing players are adopting to reduce their carbon footprint and seize opportunities in renewables and what policy instrument are being used to push firms to change their investment patterns towards green investment and innovate their way out of the fossil fuels. It will also uh, address how ESG and decarbonization mandates can affect energy companies and suppliers and the impact of the national policy and goals, including Malaysia's aspiration to reach net zero by 2050 and Euro's proposal of the carbon border tax. Yes, last but not least, our third panelist, Dr. Renato Lima de Oliveira, Assistant Professor of Business and so Society at the Asia School of Business, ASP Malaysia, and a research affiliate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, United States, where he also earned his PhD. His research agenda explores the political economy and development and state business relation, particularly in the areas of the energy transition and the industry policy. His research work has appeared in the leading journals and publishing houses, including Comparative Political Studies and Oxford University Press. He frequently speaks at academic and industry conferences, including the American Political Science Association meeting, the, the Offshore Technology Conference, OTC, and the Society of the Petroleum Engineers, SPE, and at ASB. He teaches courses on energy markets and international business for the MBA programs and executive education and leads the ASB Asia School of Business Research Center for Technology, Strategy and Sustainability, CTSS. Please welcome to our last speaker of today, Assistant Professor Dr. Renato Lima de Oliveira. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Stephen, uh, for this very um, kind introduction. Um, and it's a great pleasure to, to be sharing some of, uh, some of thoughts and some of my research material with, uh, with the audience here. I'm, I'm very passionate about what, uh, what we need in order to embrace sustainability and in particular, uh, the challenge of embracing sustainability and, and um, moving towards an energy transition that it's, uh, it's very encompassing and it's very challenging, but extremely needed. So with that, let me uh, ask to, to have my slides uh, in the screen. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm um, so the topic of my presentation is going. It's it's a it's about supply chain, and, and that's a, a great topic that we've seen uh, Professor Tan and uh, Oi Light Pink uh, addressing. Uh, but I'm I'm going to address from two different angles: the the angle of greening the today's energy system, uh, which is a brown energy system. Uh, on based on fossil fuels, but also the challenge of building the green energy supply chain of the future, the, the one that we need. Uh, and then I will conclude on, on some of these uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, before I do so, just as a, a really quick introduction, I did my PhD at MIT uh, in political economy. Uh, I study energy policy and industrial policy as well. So. So the uh, relations between uh, state and, and the business sector, to me, is a, it's one that uh, I, I'm very much interested. Uh, in particular, in how can you promote innovation? How can you promote economic diversification and also on energy transition? So what kind of uh, instruments and, and, and politics you need in order to facilitate uh, those structural transformations? Uh, I'm originally from Brazil. I tend to say that I, I don't have a Malaysian passport, but I have a Malaysian heart. I've been in Malaysia, Lima Tahun. Uh, I've been in Malaysia for five years in four different governments. Uh, that's much more than uh, many Malaysians have experienced um, uh, years ago. Uh, and it's a, it, it's a great pleasure to see uh, and, and to contribute to, to one of... Um, 
uh, one of the most important uh, uh, upper middle income economies, how it can transform itself uh, to become more sustainable. So, um, so I'm very passionate about this topic and also how to, to help Malaysia and Southeast Asia in general uh, to, to face those challenges. But I'm originally from Brazil and I've worked in different countries, including uh, Mexico uh, during its uh, uh, energy reform. Um, you can check on my uh, personal website on research, uh, different uh, material that I've uh, worked and published before, and there are many more coming out as uh, some working papers and uh, papers submitted to, to different journals. Okay, so let me get into the, the core topic. Uh, we only have 20 minutes and many interesting things to, to tackle. Uh, so... I understand that today, many of you who are joining us, you might be students at uh, APAC. Uh, you might be thinking about um, the future of your career, where you want to specialize, what are the emerging opportunities. So I will make um, um, an argument that of sustainability as a major uh, uh, opportunity of, of, uh, of job and of uh, skill creation. And I will refer to a very interesting work of MIT, uh, MIT project that I've been uh, involved somewhat on the work of the future. Uh, and that is uh, uh, in 2020, a, a report was published uh, trying to understand uh, MIT is a university, it's a typical engineering university where you have a lot of um, innovations. Um, and those innovations, they have social consequences. And that study was to understand what are the social consequences of uh, a lot of uh, uh, automation, IR 4.0, advanced uh, manufacturing, and so on. What uh, the, the social consequence of that? How can you reduce uh, political polarization? How can you uh, reduce uh, uh, wage gaps and so on? And one of the uh, data points out of this study is that um, uh, there's no lack of new tasks, new uh, work to be done. Uh, and here is one interesting um, conclusion that more than 60% of jobs done in 2018 had not yet been invented in 1940. Uh, a century ago, there was no computer industry, no solar energy jobs, no television, no air travel. Um, these are a lot of jobs enabled by technology, including jobs in IT, and solar and wind power engineering and so on. So how did they measure that? This is uh, in this study, so you can refer to, to the actual paper. Uh, uh, every 10 years, there is a census. And if enough people in the census, they mention a new profession, uh, it becomes uh, one particular category. So if, um, if enough people in the 2020 or 21, because I think it was delayed due to the COVID uh, census, if they mention that they are uh, social media influencers, then social media influencer becomes uh, one category of a job. Uh, and what we know is that um, tattooers only started to exist, only started to be character categorized in 1950, hypnotherapists in 1980, conference planners in 1990, and so on. In, uh, within the many of my colleagues and um, uh, even students who are now uh, reaching these positions, I asked them, uh, has any one of you had a grandparent who was a chief sustainability officer? Probably not, or a greenhouse gas manager. No, these are new professions. Uh, CSO is now one uh, uh, important new profession that did not exist, say, in 20, 30 years ago. Uh, but it's, uh, it's of a uh, growing importance. So jobs in sustainability are being created both by these te technological advances like uh, solar PV engineer, but also by emerging market demand and regulations in response to climate change and societal pressure. So in this world where we are committing to a net zero, uh, managing emissions across your supply chain is going to be a new critical job. Um, so CSO did not exist before, but now it's, uh, it's, it's a hot job that uh, it's going to, to grow a lot. Um, I don't know if uh, Oil Light Pink uh, has a CSO at Berjaya Pack, uh, but uh, if not, uh, that they're probably going, going to add soon. 
in if you're going to to think about uh, sustainability in moving the world to net zero one of the our key challenge is to change the energy system 80 percent of our energy system is still based on fossil fuels coal oil and gas so uh in this graph you can see the growth of uh, uh primary energy consumption in what it means is that in 30 years we have to drastically change that pattern uh, we have to increase renewables we have to radically decrease uh fossil fuels uh in in why why is that so because if we are going to tackle the climate change uh issue uh the the first sector to be radically transformed is going to be the energy because energy is responsible for over 70 percent of our man-made emissions so even though everything else is great so if there are uh, vegans uh, watching us right now thank you so much for your contribution uh that's uh, agriculture is important even though i'm a big barbecue fan so i'm not there yet uh, but I'm trying to be really green in terms of my energy choices. So um, if we don't tackle the energy imperative, everything else is a drop in the ocean of uh, what we need to do. So we need to do everything, but energy uh, is definitely a priority. Um, but energy transition is a process. It will take decades to replace the capital investment that today it runs on fossil fuels such as power plants, the cars that you have, trucks, heating systems, and so on. But that means that oil and gas will be with us uh, for some years and likely decades to come. So then there is a question, can we do it better? Can we still have uh, some continuation of the oil and gas industry? However, uh, with a gradually lower impact, and the answer is yes. But that involves reducing the carbon intensity of uh, existing um, a source of, uh, uh, of, of oil and gas, uh, but also capturing and storing CO2 if possible. And that's um, uh, one of uh, really interesting emerging market opportunities in offsetting what you cannot do. And one key thing to think about that is that not all oil barrels are created the same. Uh, the carbon intensity, it will vary across uh, different supply segments, such as an oil sand versus deep offshore versus uh, onshore. Uh, in, it also varies across the, the useful life and the extraction rate of a field. So here we have some data that shows that early on, in, when you're uh, extracting a field, um, the upstream CO2 intensity tends to be lower, but when you are reaching to the end of the useful life of that field, when it's uh, uh, getting depleted, you need to inject more gas, you need to use more energy to extract the less uh, useful barrels out of that. So it means that the carbon intensity grows uh, with time. Uh, that is particularly relevant for ASEAN because ASEAN, is a fast growing region, but relatively poor in terms of oil and gas. Most of the fields in the region are uh, close to, to be uh, um, uh, marginal fields or mature fields, uh, which means that they tend to have a higher CO2 emissions per unit of extraction. And that's, uh, that's one of the cases of Malaysia. Uh, so maybe it's not so possible to see here in this figure, um, but um, uh, ASEAN basically picked its oil and gas production in the forecast for uh, the next years are going to, to be going down. So we are still growing, we need a lot of energy, but we need to reduce the carbon intensity of uh, the additional barrel uh, of oil that we extract or uh, BTU of gas that uh, we get it. So how to do it? And here is a, a part of a managing a supply chain. Um, we will still need oil and gas for the foreseeable future, but we need to reduce the carbon footprint from that uh, source. So the way that the, the industry is doing is through one, reducing methane emissions and flaring. And here we have a global agreement on a methane pledge. Uh, second, we can electrify 
uh, platforms, either by using power cables from shore or offshore wind facilities. This is a really interesting emerging area. I'm putting here one example of uh, a small Malaysian company uh, called Pink Petroleum, uh, which just signed a pilot project and agreement to develop a field in North Sea with a floating 20 megawatt um, uh, uh, offshore wind facility. So rather than using the gas from the field to run your own compressors at the platform, you can use green energy to run the platform and thus unlock more gas, reducing the carbon intensity of your operation. I'm really proud because some of my graduates are working on this, this project. So it's a Malaysian company uh, with assets uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, so that's one, electrifying oil platforms. A second way that you can reduce your impact is through decommissioning old platforms and then recycle the steel. In that steel that used to be uh, generating a high CO2 through extraction can then be used for a new offshore wind uh, uh, turbines and so on. Uh, another um, um, uh, movement of the industry is to uh, reuse old wells rather than just plug and abandon uh, to repurpose it to serve as storage sites of carbon. So Petronas, in, and just yesterday I was talking to uh, the senior VP of strategy of Petronas in a big conference here at um, Kuala Lumpur Convention Center. Uh, Petronas has a whole project on enabling uh, carbon capture and storage and, and be able to, uh, to use those wells that they know that they are not commercially viable anymore, but rather now uh, put CO2 and be paid for that. And, and that can lead to a lot of business opportunities for, for the supply chain. And whatever you cannot do, you will need to offset. That can be uh, either uh, technological solutions of capturing CO2 uh, from the atmosphere or uh, through reforestation projects. But the key takeaway is that uh, if you are in the energy sector today, uh, and if you are in, even in oil and gas, the life cycle of a project development takes in serious consideration the carbon emissions that you will have and how to mitigate them. In different jurisdictions, you have a price for carbon. And uh, if, if your project then will have a high carbon intensity, you might not be able to develop it. It becomes uh, above your uh, break even. So that is important. Uh, a second point that I want to highlight today is about the building the green supply chain. And that's the challenge of critical minerals. So many countries and companies have committed to become net zero by 2050. That's a critical to, to limit uh, the um, uh, temperature increase to no more than 1.5 degrees. Um, but you have a lot of challenges to achieve that. One is a capital challenge. We need to be investing from today's $1.8 trillion per year uh, in energy projects, we need to, to get to $4 trillion per year by 2030. So that is a lot of uh, investments. You need to mobilize this capital. In a good chunk of that capital, we will have to go to dig for minerals. Green energy is mineral heavy. Solar PV plants, wind farms, and EVs they require much more minerals than fossil fuel based counterparts. So uh, uh, um, offshore wind turbine and, 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 and installation will have much more minerals than say uh, a gas fired uh, power plant. So, so that changes what you need uh, to do in order to, to replace uh, your current source of uh, energy. Besides, uh, not only uh, we are uh, seeing that, that change in terms of source, uh, but also in terms of how do we consume energy from chemical energy, uh, like fossil fuels, to electricity. So the electrification of the world will increase demand for many minerals, such as copper, which is heavily concentrated. So Chile is one of the biggest copper producers in the world. Uh, I've been to the biggest uh, copper mine of the world where 5% of copper comes from a single site in Antofagasta uh, in Chile. 
in 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 you also need other minerals like lithium nickel cobalt and so on so these so-called energy transition minerals they tend to be very geographically concentrated even more than oil production so today we know that opec has a share of about 40 percent of oil production the middle east uh, is uh, uh, one of the key sites for oil production when we think about cobalt it's basically Congo and China. And, and that is a huge challenge. Or lithium, you have uh, um, Bolivia, you have China, you have uh, Chile and a few other places, Australia. Uh, so all of that means that um, energy security is going to be one key challenge of building the supply chains of, uh, of the energy transition that we need. So to conclude, Energy transition is a reality. However, the pace is uncertain. The ideal pace is one that put us on a trajectory of being net zero by 2050. That will require a lot of capital investments. Uh, that will require alignment of uh, policies uh, at national level and also at corporate level. Uh, in any case, uh, regardless of if you are a company that today is already committed to net zero, or maybe you're a supplier to a company that does so, dealing with carbon emissions are now an integral part of managing the energy supply chain. So the, the, the idea that a, a CSO uh, will be even more present as a job of the future is really a, a reality because uh, as companies commit to that or as regulations move towards that, you need someone to be accountable uh, to, to change the carbon, to track, and then to reduce the carbon emissions of each uh, company. The fossil fuel industry will be with us for uh, some time, and they have a lot of work to do. They can decarbonize uh, their operations by reducing the carbon intensity uh, from what they produce. Uh, that's, that's something that we need to do. But another big challenge is to build the supply chain of green energy sources. In the constraint here, one of the key constraints are going to be the supply of minerals. Uh, that is technically challenging um, to find it, to mine it, to have access to do the social license to operate, to, to be able to finance at the scale that we need, um, but also it's going to be politically challenging. Uh, different countries are starting to restrict access to those minerals uh, with the same hopes of uh, making sure that the, they are able to sell at the highest price possible. So in general, uh, to, to some of you who are in the audience and thinking about where should I go, what kind of profession and so on, I would say that one skill that's going to be in heavy demand for the future is managing a green supply chain. So with that, uh, thank you so much, Professor Stephen and everyone. Uh, and happy to, to later join the Q&A. Thank you. Right. Um, to sum up what uh, Renato just uh, shared with us, energy's utilities uh, will need a comprehensive approach to seize the opportunities that these changes will bring about to elevate the issue of sustainability and set new standard definitely affordable reliable and green energy for everyone thank you assistant professor dr renato lima de Oliveira. right now let's turn to the uh, open discussion welcome back everybody good to see you all back here right um to all panelists the recent emergence of sustainable supply chain management has provided companies with the opportunity to review processes, materials, and operational concepts from a different perspective. It incorporates the role of the environment in supply chain value creation, and it can also build supply chain resilience. Right, the question here for everybody how can we better measure sustainability? Anyone want to go first? 
Yes, let me uh, share yeah. my, my research in this area in okay. the performance performance measurement of uh, sustainability. So I mean, I, I will let the other panel uh, panels member to talk about you know what to measure and so on. But I want to share with you uh, one of my research insights is on this uh, what we call the unforeseen or unanticipated uh, performance uh, from the from the uh, sustainability measure. So what happened is, uh, as I mentioned in, in the talk just now, for a lot of company, uh, they find it, it's kind of a big challenge for them to uh, implement you know, sustainable operation, yeah, uh, and meeting the, the set target, okay? However, life must go on, right? You cannot just because it's just difficult to achieve, you just sit there and cry. Now you have to do something, right? So when you do, when you talk about supply, supply chain sustainability measurement, it's very important that you bear in mind all these unforeseen, you know, a kind of a consequences. Yeah, because the aim of the measurement, you know, of course, we want companies to kind of a comply with the, the set target and so on and so forth, which is good. Yeah, you, you set it from the positive side, but you must also think it uh, from the other side. Yeah, because nobody wants to be measured right? and nobody enjoy it. Okay, and we all know that what you measure is what you get. Okay, so let me share with you uh, two examples. Okay, and as first, I want to tell you a story first, and then I link you with the actual example uh, in the in, in, in industry. Cool. I think this one, what we call is uh, maybe you heard about this already. We call this the cobra effect. Cobra, you know, the, the, the snake effect. So it's a story, it's about, you know, 200 years ago, you know, when the, the, the British they occupied this uh, uh, India. Uh, and then the officer in, in New Delhi, I mean, they, they enjoy the weather and so on. But what happened is uh, at that time, there are many, many snake cobras in, in New Delhi, which is a, a kind of shock to the, uh, to the British because there is no snakes or whatever in, in, in the British island. So they came up with this kind of uh, incentive for every local people. Yeah, if they can uh, kill a cobra yeah, and bring it to the officer and then they will, they will be... Uh, pay, I don't know, they say uh, 10, you know, two ringgit, for example, per snake they kill and so on. So the idea is to deduce the population of the cobra, okay, which is uh, very good, yeah, but they never foresee, yeah, the local people are very smart because to kill a cobra, you need to run around in, in the forest or in, in the bush to catch one and that is very risky and very tiring and uh, and it's a lot of full of uncertainty. Today you may get one, tomorrow you get nothing and so on. So the docker people, instead of killing the cobra that they, 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 they caught, they actually breed them, you know, in their house. So in this way, they can, they can have a constant supply of cobra that can bring it to the officer to claim their incentive or reward, for example. Yeah, so unfortunately, over time, uh, the officer found out you know, this is something that is unforeseen or unanticipated. So they scrap the, the scheme, right? And the local people, I mean, no point for them to keep corporates at home, right? So they release them, yeah? So the good incentive system or, or good uh, uh, incentive system, they start with the positive idea of deducing the population of copra. Actually, after one year, ended up with actually more copra in the population, uh, in the forest, for example, okay? So that is what we call unanticipated or unforeseen consequences. So be aware of what you measure, okay? So I don't want to name the country in Asia, but I, I, I visited many uh, companies in, in that country, right? Because of the target set by the central government can be quite high, quite difficult to achieve. Yeah, but local officers you know, or CEO and so on, they have to fulfill the target and so on. Yeah, to do that, yeah, they actually they have to do something that is a very risk, a uh, lot of uh, kind of detrimental to the environment. Yeah, for example, the pump, you know, all those waste water into the underground and so on. That's going to pollute the underground water. Yeah, or, or for example, some of the officer, they, you know, they kind of do a, a block, uh, a breakout uh, for the whole city. Yeah, uh, in certain time, you know? but keep the manufacturing factory going. Yeah, but the hospitals, traffic lights, school, you know, power cut, for example, just to meet the uh, official target and so on. So this is what we call unforeseen or 
unanticipated consequences. Yeah, so when you do perform measurement, it's very important to make sure that the measure must be robust, yeah, especially with sustainability like zero, uh, net zero, carbon footprint and so on. You have to be robust and make sure everybody engage in the process. Yeah, otherwise, you will see a lot of unforeseen uh, uh, kind of uh, consequences in light of the good invention of the measurement. Okay, that is what All I right, want to say. Yes. Yeah. Right, okay, thank you, Kim. Unforeseen, I think this is a note taken here, unforeseen. Okay, yeah, robust is a, is a key word here. So what about Lei Ping? Okay, what is your thought about that? Uh, how can we better measure sustainability in your, uh, in your context? Yes, uh, measurement. It tells us mm -hmm. where we are, the numbers. So for mm -hmm. example, Vajabek, we have this program called Recycle and Reconditions of our pa uh, packaging articles. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, Pallet itself. So for the past uh, five years, uh, from 2018 until 2022 July, I'm giving you the, the total numbers. In terms of, uh, we are going by uh, our industry's uh, uh, carbon calculators. So according to Nature's Packaging Wood Waste Calculator, from 2018 until 2022 July this year, we saved about 22,000 of CO2 emission. And if I talk about the number CO2 emission, the number you wouldn't understand what does it mean, you know, 21.1, yeah, about 20, 21.5. Uh, metric tons. But if I will convert into numbers of cars we have taken all from the road, then you will have a better idea. And from 2018 until 2020 to July, we have taken close to 73,000 cars carbon off the road. So that, that is one of the indicators. And we continuously working on different uh, processes um, to save the CO2 emissions. For example, our waste. So does we actually um, work with a partner, uh, sell it to them to generate pellets, and just by selling the waste to them to generate into another uh, product, uh, we save about eight hundred uh, M three uh, metric tons. That is equivalent to two thousand seven hundred cars off the road just by this year, January until July. So we have other measurement in other processes, in other waste stage that we created. So this is part of it. Besides that, we are talking about uh, air impurities. So we have, you know, we have uh, silo, like I mentioned, we have silo that collect all the dust. Uh, that will give us a clean environment. So, you know, when we measure against the Environmental Quality Regulation 2014 Clean Act, um, the standard is established by DOE, Department of uh, Environment, uh, is a part of compliance. Uh, the, the, the standard to, to, to meet is 150 mg per M3 and below. But Bajapak numbers is way, way below 150. We are at 4.5 or 5 mg per M3. So, so this is where we are when we say that, you know, we have to take care of social environment uh, economy and financial. So, you know, for sustainability, the number that you are talking about is part of how we measure the CO2 emissions. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Lei Ping. Uh, that, that was a good statistic you have just uh, shared with us. Uh, really nice, actually. I'm really taking note about those are the statistics you shared. Uh, thanks for that. So what about you, um, Renato? What is your thought on that, uh, which is uh, what, how can we better measure sustainability? Yeah, on the so let, let me echo the words of uh, Professor Tan uh, on on the issues of uh, unintended consequences. Uh, it's also known that what you can measure you can manage, but also that, uh, what you can measure you can manipulate. Uh, and depending on your incentives, you might end up uh, manipulating your sustainability indicators to what is covered uh, by the by the regulatory requirements and not necessarily what is um, what is best for the planet. Um, so I think this is a, an, a field that is evolving a lot with different 
uh, regulatory entities, including the Securities Commission of the United States, SEC, uh, coming up with uh, proposals to, uh, to, to regulate better the disclosure of, uh, of information that, uh, to a large extent nowadays, are largely voluntary. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, so that is an evolving field exactly to try to differentiate genuine efforts from greenwashing, uh, from uh, the beautiful claims that you see in some companies in their sustainability reports, uh, but is not exactly backed by a genuine effort. So how do you separate uh, that? Uh, this is one of the, of the challenge of our time. In the energy sector, uh, you tend to, to measure uh, sustainability in terms of uh, the scope of emissions, uh, scope one, two, and three. So scope one and two, the emissions that are within your control, uh, that the, the emissions that you are um, um, that you do in your operations or that uh, uh, ends up being used when you use energy versus the uh, emissions of uh, scope three on emissions on when people use your uh your product uh your output uh so in the case of um of a uh, oil and gas company uh you try to reduce your scope one and two by for example electrifying oil fields by being more efficient uh by being able to uh, extract more uh more oil and gas uh, using less energy uh, but you still have the issue of scope three emissions which is when um your consumers they use the uh the oil and gas uh let's see if i can okay come back to yeah, it's blur. <laughs> when your consumers they they use the the end product uh they burn it in that uh release emission so scope uh different companies when they publish their net zero roadmap uh the easiest targets are just scope one and two the challenge uh, ones are when you also add scope three uh, so you have to be really uh, careful in analyzing commitments by companies depending on how do they uh, plan to reduce their overall contributions to uh, greenhouse gases emissions. All right. Thank you, Renato. Okay. How can we instill sustainability into our suppliers? Lei Peng, you want to try this? You're on mute, Leiping. You are muted. Leiping, Sorry. You are muted. So, oh, annoying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you know, in Bajapet, we contribute to the quality of life through products and services. I'm sorry. I don't know whether you can hear the, no hear the noise. I'm, I'm in a hotel. Outside, there is something. This oh, is something okay I can... So far. <laughs> okay. So, so far, um, okay. all right. So, we have basic guidelines in the supply chain that are setting of mandatory compliances of environmental health and safety requirements during the product uh, during the production of the products and services provided to us from our supplier so we require um, uh, our vendor to restrict the use of uh, hazardous substances in the production of product and services provided to us we regularly conduct testing including third-party lab uh, laboratory tests to ensure the compliance by the suppliers. Uh, we strictly prohibit child labor or any form of slavery involved in the product and services provided to us. So the above guideline is make um, possible uh, for fair treatment to supplier when we base on quality, price, reliability, and supply stability as main criteria to make decision on initiating new business and carry out specific transactions with our suppliers. We also compare and select vendors fairly in nurturing competitions. Uh, we also do not allow our personal interests or our buyers to influence selection of prospective vendors and any bribery act will be uh, prosecuted. So, you know, we also spell requirement in the supplier self-assessment checklist. So um, there is a section assessment where supplier is to complete supplier management assessment. So we can put different standards, for example, ISO 14,000 standard in the supply, uh, uh, supplier management assessment to see where they are, right? And uh, 
We also spell out standards and regu uh, regulatory compliances such as EHS, Rojas check. So we want to know where they are. So in our selection, we are careful on that. Um, beside that, we also do on-site audit to verify the fact that they put in, you know, when they do the self-assessment to us. And we, yearly, we do annual audit. Uh, we go to the site and do uh, annual audit on, on them. So this is this is our part to instill sustainability after being carried out by our suppliers. Yeah. So Lei Ping, uh, how can how can you design more sustainable product in in continuous of that? When we look at sustainable product, uh, for example, let, let me talk about raw materials, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we have to be very mindful the source that we source. For example, you know, timber. We, we are not going to use a, a rainforest timber. What we use is leftover in the market from the furniture industry. All the wastage in one big pool, it will come to packaging industry for us to use. We source from FSC or or sustainable forest management uh, uh, vendor uh, to buy our products. Um, we look into their management, uh, whether they are fair, uh, whether they practice, uh, what, like what I say, you know, child labor and all this, they prohibit. Uh, hmm. All those that we take into consideration. So this is how, how we look into it, you know, when, when, when we talk about sustainability. So it is the product, it is the management, that's why I say it's a wholesome thing for sustainability. Yeah. So when the we look whole into ecosystem, one, yeah. Yes. So we look into mm -hmm. all these to determine who is our suppliers. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, gentlemen, how can we avoid socially negligent suppliers? Any of you? Okay, Kim, seems like you are working with a lot of professional industry. So I believe uh, you are dealing with a lot of suppliers as well. So why don't you uh, share with us, um, how can we avoid socially negligent suppliers? What is your thought here? Yeah, I, I think the question is, uh, you know, is the company duty of care extend to the action of its suppliers? I, I think we all will agree that I think, yes, right? I think this is a very important uh, question first. And uh, I just want to share with you an example, you know, because you mentioned that I, I have a, a lot of practical example. Yes, I um, used to, I mean, they were before COVID, uh, collaborating with a, a packaging company in, uh, in Hong Kong. It's a listed company, uh, but it's more, uh, not like laping type, but it's more on this uh, uh, product packaging, uh, gift, luxury goods, and also uh, uh, these uh, greeting cards and so on, right? Uh, is they also have uh, many uh, factories all over uh, Asia and, and so on. So the key, I think, to 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 avoid or to to mitigate this kind of uh, issue uh, is the engagement, right? So the company actually is a supplier to Tesco uh, in the UK. Yeah, so I see that the the top, top management uh, travel quite frequently to to UK. Yeah, to to share with them their self or assessment data. Yeah, the self assessment of the their own supply chain uh, in in Asia, uh, supplier from China, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, India, and so on, and they also uh, show to them uh, their progress uh, in terms of their uh, uh, this uh, KPI for the sustainability and so on, and uh, similar to what uh, Lei Ping said, yeah, there is also kind of a spot check or what kind of audit uh, by Tesco. So I, I, I remember I was in the one of the uh, the factory site in uh, in in in, uh, in, in Shenzhen, yeah, where a team of uh, a Tesco auditors suddenly appear <laughs> to check on their uh, sustainable kind of uh, KPI operation and, and so on. Yeah, so they they they, they leave. I mean, you know, every stone, you know, and they make sure every stone is turned. Yeah, they check everything and, and so on and uh, make sure that that is in line of what the company reported to them uh, quarterly or, or yearly and so on in the headquarter in the, in, the, in the UK. Yeah, so there is no silver bullet for this. Yeah, so the, the only way is a, is a trust and uh, engagement and open communication with your supplier. Yeah, it's something that you, have to, you only can be achieved throughout the long term. 
Yeah. But if you carry uh, a carrot and a stick, yes, uh, then that you may have the what I call I mentioned about the unanticipated or unforeseen consequences in the future. Yeah. But if you have an open and trust kind of communication a relationship, then uh, you, you can be sure. Yeah, that is a win-win for both parties in the long term. All right, thank you, Kim. Uh, Renato, you mentioned about the uh, oil and gas industry and energy industry. I think this is a huge industry here. So what is your advice here? Who can we trust to drive sustainability, especially in the sectors like oil and gas and energy? It, it's you, Professor Poon. It's you, Professor Tan. <laughs> Uh, oil and fag, it's us. Uh, it, it, there is a role for citizens to, uh, to drive sustainability standards uh, through the regulatory actions, through policy, through the political process of electing representatives who will then uh, put these uh, plans actually in plans, uh, and also consumers. And uh, in, in we have the, the rise of a voluntary standards such as fair trade, uh, rainforest alliance, and others that are commit to uh, to ensure sustainable practice throughout the supply chain. Uh, but there's only so much that voluntary standards can do. Uh, we for for the scale of transformation that we need, we, you need to have the political process. Uh, in 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 Southeast Asia. Uh, political process, sometimes it's not so open uh, in comparison to, say, uh, Europe or some U.S. states and other places of OECD countries. Uh, but th there is a recognition of this global agenda. Uh, so we need to move that forward. And business leaders, consumers and others uh, need to say that the, a sustainable production chain is what you need in order to to have higher value added production right that you are not uh, externalizing the costs of pollution that you are not using a lower tech um, a technology of production that basically is cheaper because you are passing the costs uh to the rest of the planet to nearby communities and so on so uh, a lot of uh, of that needs to be organized pressure you need to solve collective action uh, issues, uh, but uh, it, it's we should not sit and wait for someone else uh, to um, to enforce sustainability standards. But rather, it is a collective decision that uh, um, that requires continuous engagement at different levels: at the level of uh, as a consumer, as a citizen, and so on, as a business leader. Right. Thanks, um, Renato. Okay. Questions for Kim. The relationship between lean and green supply change management system as an opportunity to gain a sustainable industry future. So, will integrating lean and green supply change management systems simultaneously realize positive financial and environmental outcomes and therefore achieve higher levels of sustainability? Yes. The short answer is yes, yes, yes. <laughs> 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 okay. As you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a practical man. So let me share with you an, an example. <laughs> example from my uh, case study, you know, that I, I involved with, not mainly with me, but uh, other people in, in the process. Uh, in the UK, uh, instead of telling you the theory and background, I give you an example. I think you're all familiar with this uh, British Sugar. It's a, it's a huge company that uh, mm. uh, processing uh, sugar and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, what happened when you are in, in the processing industry? Uh, you, most of the kind of process industry machine have to be run 24 hours because you cannot just simply stop a machine and run it again and so on because it's a process industry. It's continuous. Yeah, some before you do the changeover and so on. So you use a lot of energy. Yeah, and the machine is vibrating, you know, and they create a lot of heat. Yeah, a lot of uh, carbon footprint, you know, carbon dioxide, you know, from the machine and so on. Right. So British Sugar in the UK, yeah, one of the sites in the UK, yeah, they actually channel this residual heat, you know, from the machine vibration and so on, and the CO2 created from the machine, yeah, to a plot of land, which is nearby the factory, yeah, to grow tomato. Yeah, you can check online on this uh, 
transition from the British sugar sugar refinery to tomato growing. <laughs> One of the case study by uh, Cambridge University. Yeah, so that is a classic example, a very good example. Yeah, actually you can achieve lean and green, and at the same time create a lot of uh, a benefit uh, from the process. Yeah, another example is uh, in in China with a, a kind of a textile uh, supplier I've been researching with uh, for many years uh, in Suzhou. Yeah, I think if you wear some of the leading brand uh, from the Italy or France, most likely it's from this uh, factory, right? So they create a lot of waste, water, you know, because the 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 dyeing of the color and so on. So all this uh, uh, waste water. I mean, uh, it, so so I, the, the project with the company is uh, how can they apply this again, lean and green? Yeah. Uh, to transform all those uh, non-value added, uh, which is uh, waste water, yeah, uh, residual heat, yeah, uh, into something that is value added, yeah, uh, not just for the customer and also profitable for the company, yeah. Like for example, uh, those waste water, yeah, in in uh, transform in such a way that uh, they actually become a fish pond. Okay, so the company, yeah, at the same time, you know, able to generate profit. Uh, because they, they have a lot of green credentials, they, they keep uh, getting orders from their customer from the US, uh, from the Europe. Yeah, at the same time, yeah, those waste yeah, can be uh, water, uh, can be treated. Of course, they they treated before they they, they grow, uh, they put fish into it and so on. Uh, a fish pond, and they become a mini supplier for those expensive uh, cups, you know, uh, in Suzhou, uh, based on the the the, the those waste water created from their factory and so on. Yeah, so similar to the example of this uh, Tokyo Olympic, yeah, where those are uh, electronic waste or whatever rubbish and so on, yeah, you are able to see from the customer point of view what they value, what they want, okay, and then you create the kind of uh, the the go the uh, Olympic medals from the from the recycled product and, and so on. So this is uh, there are a lot of examples, yeah. So uh, as long as you have the determination. And if you think that, uh, not think that, but uh, if you want to play your part uh, in a society, yeah, to 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 ensure that you not just uh, make money, but you also contribute to to, to the environment, uh, to the society, and so on. This lean and green, yeah, uh, uh, is is a way forward. Uh, it's a kind of what I would say is a kind of foundation for a lot of our companies, uh, or or, or, or to, I think a better word is a stepping stone for a lot mm -hmm. of companies to embark on this uh, uh, sustainable green journey. Okay, Kim, to help a supply chain preserve the dynamic aspects of lean production while assuring harmonization with the environmental aspect of green manufacturing. So what factors contribute to successful integration and attainment of enhanced level of sustainability? My uh, PhD, uh, research you know three years at the Cambridge University is about strategy implementation right so how you make it happen yeah so that applies not just for how to improve your quality how to make more money how to recruit students you know how to be the top 100 ranking uh, university in the world for example those are strategy to attend but also apply to of course sustainable goals and so on yeah one of the key finding for my research and I think it's so applicable to any of this kind of initiative is the mindset and the behavior. You can do whatever you want, okay? But if the mindset or the behavior of the workers or the company is not stick to it, yeah, what you achieve is only short term. Yeah. Over time, business as usual. Yeah, then you're going to face the same problem again and again. Yeah. So if you can address the mindset and the behavior issue, of course, this is going to be painful in the beginning yeah, because you're not going to see any result. Actually, performance or productivity may drop. Yeah, for, for most company, yeah, that would be a big pain. And then most of them, 95% from research, yeah, found out that 95% of the company, they will kill the project or initiative when they see there's no uh, initial gain and so on, which is wrong. Yeah, because like, for example, yeah, if I ask you to write Stephen Poon, right, you, will, you can write it in less than two seconds, for example. Like, but I would say, okay, Stephen Poon, I think I want to make your life easier. I want to improve your writing to make it one second. Yeah, you only write the alternate later. This means you start with S, then you skip T, they go for E, you know, leave out alternate later. 
Okay, so this actually simplified your writing, right? Make your life easier. But I take out the familiarity from you. Suddenly you have to think, boy, how can I write my name if I leave out alternate letter? Right? So it's going to take you maybe one minute or two minutes to write your name. From two seconds to two minutes. Right? I will go for a spoon. <laughs> I will go but for a spoon. Yeah, spoon you is practice easy. That. Yeah, you practice that over time. Let's say for another uh, 20 times or whatever. Then you can memorize it and so on. Then you can write it even less than one second. Okay, example. Kim. Yeah. Do do lean initiatives spill over to in to reduce environmental waste due to lean waste elimination culture? Yes, I think this is linked to the 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 point I I I I I, I mentioned just now. Yeah, it's all about this uh, uh, mindset and the behavior are key, mm. you know, to, to make them happen. Yeah, I think the question that you asked this and there are quite interlinked. Yeah. To, mm -hmm. sim uh, to simplify the answer, yes, the, the mindset and the behavior, they are, they are foundation to most of the uh, things that we discussed today. May I share? May I share? I can't, I can't more agreeable to uh, Professor Ching Tan here about green and lean is complementary to each other. Um, yeah, so for, for Bajar Pack, you know, when I came in seven years ago, uh, the company has a lot of holes. And what, what Professor Tan talked about here is, is, is exactly, you know, you want to talk about green, it, it associates with a lot of quotes, right? So uh, for us, I know that when I first came in, I need to tidy up the company. We don't have, financially, we were weak, right? So we, we started actually lean management back in 2017 uh, under MTIB's uh, 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 guidance. Uh, you know, we took up the lean Crenova. So by Malaysia Timber Industrial Board, and we emerged as a champion. And subsequently, we also, we also participated in MPC, Malaysia Production uh, Corporations, uh, Lean Management, we, we got silver. Now, whether we got champion or silver, it, it's not, it's not, uh, it, it doesn't matter. But what it taught us is that it elim eliminated the waste. Uh, that is cost saving, actually. It helped us go through the very difficult part in the initial stage when we were <laughs> broke and poor. It helped us go through that stage and slowly improve and progress, you know, to the next stage. So we are talking about, you know, seven or eight waste stages, right? Overproduction is one of it. Uh, defects, uh, waiting time, um, non-utilized talent. Uh, we talk about transportation. To, to just name a few. So if, you know, we can work on the lean and continue to work on it, uh, even though we are not perfect at this time, actually, pandemic actually uh, messed us up, you know. During the <laughs> pandemic, do just in case, not just in time. When you just, when you change just in time to just in case, you have a lot of waste stages, you know, because we, we cannot afford to fail our orders, right? PO contract, sales order that we sign, we cannot fail that. So during the pandemic, we turned into JIC, but JIC does carry a lot of uh, cost in inventory, right? But that also outweighs, you know, if we were to fail customer, that there's a lot, the penalty was even higher than the, you know, the, the wastage cost to us. But now, you know, post pandemic, we are trying to rectify every angle. So coming back to lean management, make it tighter. Uh, yeah, so, so I couldn't, agree more that green and lean is complementary and for company out there you know it, it it i know it's very difficult to talk about green initiative you know you have to think really far ahead you know the system the design and the use right that i talk about and and you start from lean you know and and start from small how you can impact the environment how you can improve of, on your processes by eliminating the wastages and start from the small steps, it, it will bring you quite far, like like how you know, like like what we are going through now. Okay, Lei Bing, let's stay with you here. There is a need to identify appropriate indicators to measure the sustainable activities in the supply chain and figure out the relationship that combined social and environmental dimension with supply chain activities to understand how to achieve the goal of sustainability. So Leiping, how can the sustainability concept be defined 
and apply into supply chain management in Pajaya's pack daily operations. Sustainability concept. Okay, I, I, I will still go back to, to, you know, okay, one of the things that we are doing now, right, uh, to, to ensure sustainability, this concept not only to us, but across the board is actually, we, we are actually embarking, going to uh, embark on a journey called circulatory, circular uh, logistic. So in this circular logistic, we are not only benefiting ourselves because we are growing, we are in expansion, right? So we are into a uh, 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 few locations. So at current moment, we are in Penang, we are in Prai, we are in Kedakulim, uh, we are in Johor already, we are in Ho Chi Minh, right? So because of this location, uh, we see ourselves, you know, uh, we can utilize the location to provide circular logistics. That is the circularity of the economy we are talking about. So we can build product for our customer to move, for, to assemble from point A to point B to point C. And during this movement, you know, we can provide the product, we can provide the repair services and recycle services. So our customer don't have to buy new product. And these value added services, in, in fact, you know, help our customer to save cost, right? Uh, so, so this is one of the things that, you know, like the, the two gentlemen share here, sometimes statistic can be manipulative, right? Uh, you come up with program. The program itself, if it's benefit your customer, you know, in sustainability effort, I, I think that this benefit the community as a whole. In fact, we have other other initiative. We are yet to come out and we are already foreseen. We are able to do it because we are in different locations and our product, you know, Timber is, is a renewable and it, you know re, re, uh, renewable uh, uh, resources. Uh, we use forest plantation timber. We use what is left over in the market. Um, so so yeah. So in a sense, it has to benefit the community, the society as a whole to impact the environment. Besides talking about indicators in numbers. Okay, uh, Lei Ping. In furtherance of the mention, what are the key success factors for implementing a strategic sustainable supply chain management in packaging industry nowadays? Again, your question? Uh, what are the key fact uh, what are the key success factors for implementing a strategic sustainable supply chain management in the packaging industry? Okay. One of the things you know our customer continuously to look for is cost cutting. Right. In order to do cost cutting, it is it's, it's, it's very difficult. You know, raw material is increasing, labor is increasing, and you're talking about cutting costs, right? Now, this is when technology came in. You know, um, you know, we are able to design our packaging material using the technology that we have, the software that we have, you know, the pallet design system or or um solid work, you know, uh uh certain software were able to help us develop, you know, when customer give us a dimension of their goods to be packed, we are able to use our software to design the packaging, the dimension, and we were able to look at the software to tell us where, what is the loading performance like? If they were to stack the goods in certain way, where is the loading point, right? So with that, we can actually suggest before even build the product, you know, to, to, to our customer, look at the, the design itself. That's why I say everything comes up with the design. In our box, you know, our design have to serve a few purpose. You know, our design, the cover, if you turn it over, it, it can become a ramp to push up the product. If you turn it over, it can become a cover. So from the design, we talk about, you know, how they use it, how the design and the system that we can recycle back. Yeah. So the technology itself, like what Renato is, is talking about, Helping us without building, you know, we can have, have a skeleton, have some base to talk to our customer. When everything is to their satisfaction, then we'll build first sample for testing. When during the testing, we'll find out a more detailed things to improve. And then we'll build the, the real uh, first few piece to test it out in real time. Transport it to US, transport it to anywhere where, where the customer wants us to do before we mess produce the, the, the packaging material, uh, packaging goods for our customer. 
Yeah, I totally agree. Lei Ping, you know, as a design practitioner myself, and uh, really appealing to me, I you know the things what you said. I think this is the, what I talk about. This is supply chain design. So thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thanks for the sharing. Um, okay, uh, question for Renato. Um, as the pressure to further transform one's own organization rises, so too do do the uh, the opportunities to open up new business areas and unlock the resulting potential for growth. How can we increase the value of the company through sustainability? Mm. Uh, so how can we increase the value of a company through sustainability? Yeah, through sustainability, yes. So this this is a simple yet complicated question. Uh, simple <laughs> in the sense of uh, uh, if you if if you adopt sustainability through lean principles, and I I had the pleasure of uh, teaching uh, lean management with uh, James Womack, one of the gurus of uh, of uh, of lean, uh, and and it is fantastic if you if you identify muda, if you identify what the waste, and then be able to. Uh, come up with uh, more efficient processes. Uh, you are doing more of what you do in a better way, and that's uh, that's also being sustainable. Um, so, so that is uh, one way where you you add value uh, to it by uh, by identify source of uh, uh, of waste uh, in your operations. But sustainability, as understood uh, more broadly, uh, also on an ESG framework. And that's the, so 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 the first answer was the simple one is like be able to identify where uh, what you're doing today is is not efficient and just do it more efficient and uh, that for example energy efficiency is that low hanging fruit uh, you have several people that works as energy consultant they can go to your company or factory and then identify where you are wasting uh, electricity or now you can also add uh, solar panels and other things like that but one important thing is that not every sustainability action will be will result directly in profitability uh it's a myth uh that uh, to say oh that uh, every like green thing you're going to do is going to be great for the bottom line that's not the case because you are internalized externalities and that unless you do have an alignment of policies uh in taxes and uh premium paid by consumers uh there is a cost uh in some of the actions so in, within the broader framework of esg uh when you take into account social impacts of your operation i'm, I'm uh, for example uh oil like uh like thank uh, she mentioned that uh, we don't deal with suppliers with uh, slave labor issues and so on and so on uh so that's that's great to hear uh, um competitors might deal with that in, in the short run, they might have a, uh, they might be more competitive uh, at the cost of their reputation, at the cost of dealing with uh, uh, issues such as unable to export to the United States because the custom border uh, office is now uh, clamping down on, on such things. So in the short run, you might have to take actions that are costly. You might have to say no to some suppliers. Uh, but you're preserving your reputation, you're building value that can be sustainable over time. Uh, so uh, uh, typically here is a strategic thing that at the board level, you need to have uh, a conversation about what are the risks that we are willing to take, how we are going to move the business forward, what are our values as the company, what we want to be known for, in increasingly, and that's the good thing, increasingly financial markets with a, a ESG concern, they will look for uh, mistakes in that area. So if, if you are well-intentioned and you know that uh, if you do not behave well, it might hurt you later, it's easier to lead the conversation at the board level to align values and say, here's our sustainability strategy, here's what we are going to do, Yes, there's going to be a, a capex for that. Uh, it might be costly, but that's why we are doing. Uh, so I think that alignment, that clarity of purpose, 
uh, is really important throughout the organization. So you can have a conversation with your CFO, with your, your chief of procurement, uh, CEO and your CSO and so on. If conventional sources used in industry are replaced by renewable energy so, uh, sources, the carbon footprint of the industry is automatically decreased by replacing or offsetting the requirements for fossil fuel emission with net zero energy sources like solar and wind. So, uh, Renato, however, what is the consequence of decreasing the carbon footprint of the industry? But the consequence is good. Uh, it's not easy uh, because you're, you have to integrate variable intermittent uh, new energy source uh, into your production line or into the grid. So it is a, it is a challenge. But uh, again, if you're able to, to show that you are on a trajectory of reducing your carbon emissions, and that can signal to investors and to consumers uh, that you're serious about your sustainability uh, value proposition, the consequences, uh, it's, uh, it, it's very good. Not easy. It's really not easy uh, due to, to different uh, local incentives, due to different uh, challenges, uh, productive challenges. Uh, however, uh, it's really the way to go. Um, so, so we are living in a... Um, uh, every industry consumes energy, and the energy industry is changing really fast. Uh, so if you have the support of consumers uh, to, uh, to use lower carbon sources of energy, then uh, we can achieve the, the transformation that we need. And uh, one, one consequence of that is that uh, some countries, they are studying uh, adopting carbon-adjusted border taxes, which means that when you export, say, to in the future to an European country, you might be taxed according to the amount of carbon that uh, was uh, used to manufacture your product. So if you're able to, to show that um, you actually have a lean production and clean and green, uh, in that your product uh, didn't have a high carbon content, uh, it means that you are more competitive. Uh, and even before that uh, legislation takes into effect, uh, it means that you will be you you'll be more resilient. Uh, you will be less exposed to regulatory risks. So that's one of the areas that I teach on uh, political risks to investment. And being in a dirty industry is today it's a major uh, risk to investment. Okay, Renato, I'm gonna take along with what you just mentioned there. Industries and businesses play a huge role in boosting the economy of any country by bringing in a huge amount of revenues, maintaining the per capita income and providing large scale employments to people from several fields of society. But how can the deployment of sustainable energy in industry lead to the stimulation of the economy? Well, you need to invest, as I said uh, in my presentation, we need to move from two trillion, $1.8 trillion of uh, capital investment per year in the energy industry to more than $4 trillion. Uh, all of that means that um, it's easy. Like in Malaysia, 10 years ago, there were no EPCCs for solar energy, um, basically. Uh, now you have several companies that are investing in solar energy farms, in uh, in rooftop uh, solar energy, in business uh, through net metering, feeding tariff, and so on. Um, in the rest of the world, you have uh, um, fantastic supply chain related to biomass or ethanol, say in Brazil, uh, wind energy in the UK, where Professor Tan is, uh, in, 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 and so on. So uh, the, the the magnitude of transition that we need means that we need to invest a lot. Um, there are many jobs being generated across the value chain. Uh, the, the public policy question is, uh, how should we localize those jobs? And that is, uh, what kind of incentives for local manufacturing, but also for um, uh, integrating the supply chain with R&D? So Malaysia, for example, has a pretty sizable, uh, one of, 
I think it's the third in the world in solar PV production. We have manufacturing a plant in Penang, in Kedai, and so on. Uh, but we don't have so much R&D on developing the cutting edge technologies of, uh, of solar PV. But we could, uh, we could integrate more on that. So, so here's a role for public policy on making sure that um, uh, the, uh, a new uh, energy carrier like hydrogen, uh, that we are not only investing in deployment as Sarawak Energy is doing Sarawak and with Petronas or even TNB, but also that uh, we are involved into the R&D phase, making sure that we capture the, the value added from dominating uh, the knowledge component of that supply chain. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, let's uh, Q&A from the public, right? I think there's a time to take a look at the question from the audience. Um, the first, I think the question that I received that, um, right, uh, how far has government supported policies for green supply chain? Right, okay, any of you want to respond to that? I, I may say something from the UK side. Yeah, uh, I think government actually play a big role in ensuring a sustainable supply chain. Take for example, in uh, 2015, uh, the UK government uh, published the Anti-Slavery Act that require you know this uh, UK company you know in certain size yeah uh, to publish you know every year a statement about their supply chain yeah so about the, the what step they have taken to ensure that their supply chain not just in the UK and you know, all over the world yeah that is free from slavery so that is a is a very powerful uh, it, uh, kind of step uh, taken because as in any company that is a part of the supply chain like say for example you know Tesco is a big company right so not just apply this uh, anti slavery act not just apply to Tesco yeah but the Tesco first tier supply supply uh, supplier second tier third tier and a supplier to the third tier fourth tier and so on and so forth yeah so you can see the ripple effect on it yeah I believe uh, in Malaysia and other countries there also other initiatives being taken but a simple uh, act the anti-slavery act uh, you can see the, the deeper effect uh, in, in achieving this sustainable supply chain in the long term okay okay thank you uh okay. let's look at another question how to achieve green credentials i think this question is quite big uh it can be for uh for everybody it depends on how we what kind of aspect we are looking at how to achieve green credentials yes how to achieve green credentials sir Yes. Any of you want to respond to that? I think we can start from small. Don't have to think very big when we talk mm. about green credentials. We start from mm. ourselves, you know, mm. whether we dispose properly, uh, the plastic, mm. metal, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, bottle. So, so it starts from us. So for a company, it's also the same thing. Whether you bring into the company culture to all the employees to start segregating your waste stages, number one. Number two, look into EHS, safety, safety and health, right? You can do a lot in safety and health. For us, we, we, we do a proper ducting system in our silo so that we don't have to breathe in the, the debris of our sodas, right? For all our employees working there. Uh, we, we, we talk about, you know, water, all of us use water at home. Start for something that you can control, right? Uh, for for company level, uh, I, I just share, you know, for example, we need to heat treat our product. So we find ways to do away with fumigation that calls for metal bromide. We use heat treatment chamber to heat treat and the heat come from our boiler where we burn our waste wood all the waste stages go into the boiler, burn, we, we, we harvest the energy to heat treat our, our wood article, the packaging uh, uh, products. That is one of them. We also invest in heat treatment uh, uh, equipment to shorten the heat treatment cycle from 8, 12 hours or even few days to a matter of 10, 20 or 30 minutes. So these are the things that you can look into it. Don't have to go very big because when you think very big, you are stuck. 
But you think of something small that you can do, you grow from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Kim, you feel yeah, like, yeah. I feel we, like you want to say something. have uh, plenty of time. I can uh, share a lot of a long story and then, uh, of course, <laughs> Yeah, of course. Yeah, we have <laughs> very limited I'm time. I'm older, you know, let tell story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Kim, let's stay with you now. Um, um, I have questions uh, for you. Let me uh, add to the leaping point. I think what they been say is very, very important. You know, it, it's all about this, uh, what we call Kaisan, you know, Kaisan or continuous improvement. Yeah, it's the mindset and the behavior. You cultivate them, you know, with a small step. And that is very important. Mm. I mean, let me share with you another example. I think we all know about Toyota production system or Lean, right? So you can uh, watch on YouTube. Uh, you see a lot of presentation, you know, Japanese worker in Toyota. I think they give, I don't know, 20,000 uh, improvement citation per year, something like that. Whether in Malaysia, I mean, I used to work in Malaysia. I never give any suggestion in, in for five years or whatever. You know, you can see the 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 the, the difference and so on. Yeah, but it's a, it's the time to bring you back. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people, yeah, uh, they will see that. Wow, um, you see these uh, workers, you know, operators, shop floor cleaners, toilet cleaner, and so on. They actually contribute a lot to lean or to improvement in Toyota. Yeah, but actually. Yeah, based on the real uh, research by the Japanese, because only the Japanese really understand lean anyway. Yeah, they found out that you know, ninety percent actually of those suggestion, yeah, of those millions or millions of suggestion per year, actually don't really add much value uh, to Toyota. It is the practice, it's the culture they want to cultivate. You know, even at the operator level, for them to contribute ideas to engage. Uh, with the management say oh i have this idea and so on because from the factory operation point of view yeah it's very costly for you yeah if you have implemented a system and suddenly someone to come to you and say oh that is not good you have to change this it's going to cost you a lot of money you're going to disrupt your supply chain and so on actually Toy uh, toyota they have really have used a lot of 3d simulation and they pick up all those potential issue and mistake uh, uh, you know in the operations However, we are human, right? It's not possible to achieve 100%. It's likely to be on a small area here and there, need to be improved. Yeah, so it's where those operators, you know, quality control circles and so on come in. But the actual fact is that they want to cultivate the culture and the mindset and also the behavior, yeah, you know, from the beginning. Yeah, so over time, some of these operators, they may become a line manager, supervisor, become senior management and so on. So that culture will be uh, 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 kind of instilled. But it's a long term, it's, it's a kind of a, a long process, like what uh, 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 Le Peng said, you know, it's don't expect, you know, you achieve the result the next day and so on. Yeah. Okay, Kim, as one of the sustainable issues in the companies today, actually, the employment of the life cycle cost-based solution, companies like Japanese printer manufacturer uh, Coisera, Compact Design Headquarters in Houston, UK's Royal Mail, as well as UPS, Sony Corporation Manufacturer Workers UK, which is according to your presentation. So how can life cycle cost-based solution help achieve sustainable goals and um achieve sustainable goal of the supply chain yeah very good i think this is a very very good question yes um as a practitioner uh, i i don't want to engage into the theory part because i think you can just google and find all the, the you know, success factor how to do it and so on but i want to share with you you know uh, the kind of experience example snippet that i get you know from like i, I deal with companies uh, uh, in different part of the world i mean i don't know whether you notice or not in the uh, in the last uh, few months, uh, there's a big uh, news on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the newspaper. It's about Apple. You know, I think most of us have an iPhone, right? Apple is uh, announcing that yeah, they're going to set up uh, this online store where you can buy the spare part yeah, to repair your iPhone. You can do it yourself. Yeah, in the past, if you have an iPhone, you could problem with a battery. But iPhone battery usually lasts, I don't know, two years. After two years, they're not performing well, you have to go and get a new one, and you have to go to the appointed supplier, take a, a, a no, uh, appointment, take a long time, and so on. 
But now you actually can go online, uh, buy the spare parts, and then you can do the changes, you know, the placement of the parts yourself. Okay, so this is just an, an, an example, you know, a kind of a company actually pushing for this kind of uh, life cycles. They don't just see that I'm selling you a product, okay, and then you can use it, and then uh, uh, when it's outdated, you throw it away, you buy another new product. But they expect you to keep it for a longer term because they themselves commit uh, to, to this uh, corporate social responsibility, you know, sustainable goals and so on. And because they are also aware, consumer like you and I, yeah, we have become more uh, aware and we, we can find information on internet and so on. Yeah, so we will take them responsible for uh, responsible for that. So instead of waiting for us to push them, they are already taking steps. Yeah, to ensure that they take all the boxes and, and so on. Another more recent one, I think in March uh, this year, the EU just set a new regulation. Okay, I think you heard about H and M, right? Primark, where you go and buy the fast fashion, Zara. Yeah, you can have a latest wish, uh, fashion for I don't know. Uh, 20 pounds and then you use it for two months you throw away you can get another one and so on it's what we call fast fashion right the eu just set a new regulation put the stop to all this right so you will see that the shirt i'm wearing actually 20 years already yeah <laughs> so it's a uh, important yeah to, to put the stop on all this yeah because we think about the long-term implication yeah it's about the life cycle and they uh, make the product more sustainable durable because in the long term, it's a win-win for both. Because uh, for consumer, yeah, you, you can spend less, yeah, because you are able to repair. Because if you will see that a lot of uh, luxury goods company, now so they also launch new services where you can buy those uh, uh, kind of uh, textiles or, or tools or whatever, and they even have video to teach you if you have a holes, small holes, of course, yeah, uh, in a shirt, very expensive Versace, for example, yeah, you actually, actually can patch it. Yeah, so you can keep wearing the shirt for another year and so on. Yeah, so they are doing their bit. Yeah, into this kind of uh, the whole product life cycles. Okay, so I hope these examples uh, in inspire a lot of companies and also for the audience to aware that. So, so a lot of steps been taken in, in, into this uh, uh, life cycle assessment or life cycle costing assessment and so on and so forth. Yeah. All right. Thanks, uh, Kim. Thanks for the input, Lei Ping. Um. Basically, uh, suppliers and manufacturers' sense of responsibility and measures of sustainability often don't align with that of the brands they are catering to. So how do you make sure that your suppliers and manufacturers' sense and measure of res uh, responsibility and sustainability align with your own? Like I share, you know, when we buy off a supplier, we have this uh, assessment on the supplier's code of conduct um, and they have to um, self-assess for us before we go move on. So once they self-assess, of course, we have to go and audit whether it's real or not. So that's why we will go for on-site audit to check out all those things that they say they think they have committed. Um, yeah, so for us, we are supporting MNC. Uh, big name, big name outside uh, for, for Penang area. We, we support most of the MNC actually. So we are very careful on that because MNC do have their own code of conduct for the suppliers like us and they expect us to carry it down to our suppliers. So whatever criteria that we get from our MNC customer, we will internalize it ourselves and then we will also carry it out downline to our suppliers. So, so it's, it's a very strict uh, assessment and selection process to our suppliers. Yeah. How can you monitor the? Uh, uh, how can you monitor the sustainability measures taken across your entire supply chain, preferably in a way that also makes this information accessible to your customer? You see, uh, we have to build uh, the, our procurement team, our sourcing team. Uh, with competency and capabilities in the area of sustainability. It all starts from these people who go out to meet the suppliers, right? To outsource everything for, for the company. So you have to build the competencies in them in the knowledge of sustainability. 
And from there, we have you know other departments, for example, our QA, that work into the quality assessment, right? So from whatever the supply give to us, we will work into it beside the competencies of our procurement team. So we build into it and uh, we integrate sustainability goal in the into the policy, into our procurement policy and strategies and procedures also. So with the policy procedures implemented, you, you just tighten the, the knots so that we can achieve that. Thank you. Uh, Renato, investors need to prioritize action and engagement on ESG risk and opportunity based on the materiality to the company. And in the case of risk, the severity of the potential adverse impacts, to what extent does the company collaborate with other stakeholders related to, a, uh, to, related to ESG issue? Well, one um, characteristic of uh, sustainability is that um, you are not alone. Uh, you're part of a planet, you're part of an uh, ecosystem, you're part of a supply chain. In, um, in your impacts uh, inside the firm, we only have a limited um, uh, output if you're not able to actually collaborate with other partners. And, and that includes the rest of the supply chain. So what we, we have seen is that not only uh, lead firms, so using a terminology from global value chains that you have lead firms, then uh, suppliers and so on, not only lead firms, they have the uh, responsibility of uh, um, um, making sure that uh, they have clarity on standards and uh, what, are, what sustainability means to, to, to them, uh, but also they have to contribute towards knowledge sharing and sometimes cost sharing for upgrading practices uh, that uh, without that, it's really challenging for uh, suppliers with low margins to be able to upgrade practices on their own. So it has to be a collaboration. Uh, from the point of view of investors, uh, what we have seen is that basically you have two different uh, methods of uh, dealing with, uh, with, with, with companies and manage your uh, uh, portfolio. Either you divest, either you say that there are certain companies or there are certain sectors that I don't want to touch. Uh, there might be a lot of climate risks and I don't want to, uh, to have those companies or sectors in my portfolio, or you engage. Uh, so by engaging is you try to influence management uh, to uphold better practices and change the sector from the inside. Uh, so we we have an interesting case of uh, Exxon versus Engine Number One, which is a uh, um, one uh, asset company that was able to actually uh, nominate three members to the board of Exxon. And they are uh, they are now trying to engage with um, they created an ETF to uh, to hold shares of companies throughout SAP 500 and then try to influence the uh, annual shareholders meeting and try to vote, uh, change the board in a way that will push um, sustainability um, priorities inside companies. So what it means is that um, uh, it, it is an ecosystem that will be different stakeholders. You will need to build coalitions in favor of that necessary transformation. Okay, thank you. Uh, question for all. It is important to investigate the supply chain challenges faced by companies and suggest sustainable mitigation strategies. How COVID-19 disruption could affect the supply chain's policies in networks of interconnected relationship in future? Very interesting question. Can I, can I answer okay, this Okay, Kim. One? Yeah, please, Kim. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, can, I also can do a promotion soon because I'm going to give a talk in, uh, in, 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 in Penang about <laughs> this supply chain resilience at some point soon anyway. But, right, send me but, the email. <laughs> Kim, send me the email. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is... Uh, I think this is a, a, an interesting uh, area. I, I've been doing a lot of research in, in this with many, many companies on, on, on this one. But what well, you can see that it, the impact of COVID is that in the future, yeah, 
they will be uh, the impact is the it will break the global supply chain and it is now because global supply chain actually get add a lot of value you know because existing global supply chain is run uh, very efficiently and so on but because of COVID nineteen and uh, because of the the trade war and and so on yeah so we're going to to break this uh, supply chain apart yeah so you will see that there will be more kind of a local supply chain uh, in the future yeah uh, if you look at the uh, the literature. Uh, there is growing numbers of literature about onshoring. Onshoring, this means uh, companies are bringing back, you know, their operation, you know, from overseas back to their home country. Yeah, there's a, a high number of uh, articles now on this onshoring and, and so on. So to mitigate this uh, disruption and to make uh, supply chain more resilient, uh, there's going to be more uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, local manufacturing. Yeah, the firm will try to make their uh, supply chain uh, shorter yeah and uh, take another good example is the uh, the semiconductor chips yeah i think uh, we, we all have impacted by this because your microwave your oven you know your car your television they all got you know need the microchips and so on right and with the trade war and the disruption on the the microchips and supply chain yeah there's a uh, shortages of it and so on a lot of company now actually are going to going back from outsourcing to vertical, vertical integration. Yeah, you look at the Sony, and uh, not Sony, you look at Microsoft, Intel, Google, Apple, and so on. They all set up their own, you know, chips design team. And, and actually they are uh, you know, pinching the workers, you know, from each other and, and so on. In fact, five years ago, uh, Apple already have a, a, a own design team on this uh, microchip and so on. Right. So you will see the implication of it. Uh, this are uh, post-COVID, yeah, after COVID uh, supply chain will be very, very different. Yeah. And then to for company in order to respond to it, right? Yeah, you know, there have to be more uh, uh, resilience, uh, not just about resilience, but able to recover and uh, response is what I call a three R. Yeah, uh, rapidly uh, with, with these changes. Yeah. And uh, uh, because I'm conscious of time, yeah, so there are a lot of examples, yeah, I, I have uh, worked with companies yeah, in, in applying this 3R so they can uh, respond you know, quickly and then in fact gain market share uh, during the disruption of the COVID where other companies uh, were not able to respond fast enough, yeah, who, who actually suffer uh, from this uh, COVID-19 disruption uh, and we also suffer uh, from this uh, uh, disruption impact on their sustainable, uh, sustainable uh, kind of initiative. But uh, having the three R in place, uh, you actually can make your supply chain leaner uh, and then uh, and more green and, and so on. Right? So I hope I don't uh, take too much of the time of other uh, members. All right. Thank you, Kim. Um, Lei Ping, what are your thoughts on uh, how COVID-19 disruption could affect the supply chain policy in networks of interconnected relationship in future? Okay, so in, during the pandemic, we see how severely shipping, um, yeah, you know, being, human being delayed. Being delayed is one thing. Uh, you know, during pandemic, you know, we, we don't have workers, right? All have to be quarantined for some reason, right? So it's not so easy to mobilize labor. And then you have this trade war. So now, like what Kim say here, Right, um, you have this onshoring where company move back to their own country to manufacture. I see that the, the 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 world will come together in another level. We used to import or export, right, and and depend on the vessel to carry the raw mat to from one continent to another continent. I think you will see less of that because of onshoring is happening due to war, trade war, or due to certain things, pandemic or whatever. So I, I will see that. You know, from globalization, things will move into localization. It's still in a global sense, but it will be localized a lot. Uh, so in another sense, it also gives opportunities. I, I don't know whether, you know, the rest see, but I definitely see opportunities that, that Brajabek can play because we are in Southeast Asia and we are being exposed to Western education. And, and, you know, like a lot of us, we, we study, like I study in US, I stay in US, I come back and stay in Southeast Asia. I know the Western culture very well. I also know China very well. I also know Southeast Asia very well. So we are in the position to, you know, we, we are in the position to have the opportunity to source from 
these locations and, and make things available to the West. Their buyer, their procurement team, their outsourcing team don't have to fly all the way to Southeast Asia to do the procurement. We serve as an expert in quality buy-off, in looking for all the raw mats for them and make it available to them. So in that sense, I see some collaborations. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Lei Ping. Uh, Renato, what is your final thought on that? I agree with uh, with Professor Tan and Lei uh, Ping uh, that we we are uh, fundamentally facing a rethinking rethinking of uh, design of supply chains, uh, and that implies um, opportunities as well, right? So it can be a great opportunity for Malaysia uh, and for companies, uh, as Lei Feng mentioned, companies that are um, um, comfortable in dealing with uh, 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 Western uh, firms and also very knowledgeable of uh, uh, how to operate in, in Southeast Asia. So uh, it also means that uh, uh, some of the, the things that we took for granted during the lean management revolution might need to, to be rethought in a, in, in a moment of uh, trade wars and uh, political barriers for trade. Uh, right, so it, it, these are, are artificial barriers, but they have a real consequence. Um, so, so, so then you have to have contingency in plans. Uh, in, in in different research projects that I'm doing, uh, we have seen that a lot as as well. Uh, so, it's a new world out there, uh, and no one thought that uh, you would see a war in Europe uh, happening, uh, but it, it is happening. Uh, some people would also not uh, think that uh, Germany would be restarting coal power plants, but it's happening. Uh, so uh, scenario plan is important, and we are in 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 in, in one um, uh, uh, low probability scenario. Uh, but we need to to prepare for these uh, kinds of contingencies. So to some, these are great opportunities. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so for, I think uh, we're going to end this. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all the esteemed panels. Indeed, the wonderful audience uh, who had clearly tuned in and posed the great questions early on. I think I'm going to summarize the conversation. So despite the discussion on managing supply chain sustainability, use ethical and environmentally sound practices at every stage. With the goal of reducing air, water, and waste pollution, uh, according to Lei Peng, needless to say, designing a sustainable supply chain requires different practices. Green purchasing, which means finding suppliers with environmentally sustainable products and services, is just as important as greening your own operation. Green manufacturing, focuses on using fewer non-renewable natural resources, reducing pollution and waste, and keeping emissions to the minimum among other green practices, green packaging. Consider that every phase of a package life cycle that includes everything from how your supplier resources material to how consumers dispose of the packaging, according to uh, uh, Lei Ping. Uh, green warehousing focuses on uh, ensuring warehouses run more efficiently, reducing waste and energy use. One big challenge is that warehouses grow obsolete quickly. So, and um, the next is the green transportation. According to the uh, EPA, US Environmental Protection Agency, transportation. Uh, cost 28.2% of 2018 greenhouse gas emission more than any other source. And the last life cycle management, green product design always consider the complete life cycle of the item. Human activities operated in ecological deficit drawing on resources needed for the, uh, for the future. Now that most individuals and organizations recognize the, uh, the, the 
detriment of the overshooting nature's capacity to support its occupants. Finding sustainable solution has gained momentum. This drive has led to a variety of the green innovation in recent years, particularly when it comes to supply chains. With that, thank you so much to Dr. Tang Kim Hua, Professor of Operation and Innovation Management and Associate Dean for Research and Knowledge Exchange, Nottingham University Business School, United Kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, actually, uh, I'm a Malaysian and I haven't uh, spent a uh, Malika uh, day in Malaysia for the past uh, 25 years. So today, I'm so honored to be invited to take part in this uh, National Day event. Yeah. And uh, even though, again, I'm not able to be back in Malaysia for this uh, coming 65 uh, uh, Malika Day, and uh, but I'm uh, I'm really happy uh, uh, to be able to contribute to share some of my uh, research ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Um, and also, thank you so much to uh, Miss Oile Peng, Chief Executive Officer of Puchaya Pack Malaysia. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Stephen, for having me on this platform. Indeed, it's my great honor to, to come to know Dr. Uh, Professor Kim Tan and Professor Renato and their background. And the sharing here really benefits me. Not, not only that I share out and benefit the rest, uh, listen, uh, a viewer to this uh, forum, but I think just talking to both of them enriched me so much and talking to you also, uh, Dr. Stephen, by opening up the subject so that I, you know, really think deeper into it. So I really thank you for this, you know, evening that well spent with three of you and the rest of the viewers to this forum. Thank you so much. Indeed, it is a pleasure. And of course, uh, thank you so much to uh, Dr. Renato Lima de Oliveira, Assistant Professor of Business and Society. Asia School of Business, ASB Malaysia, and also a research affiliate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, United States. Thank you so much. It has been a great pleasure. Uh, sustainability is one of the main issues of our time, and it's challenging to implement, and we need to have a lot of uh, capability building and knowledge exchange. So it has been a pleasure to learn from Professor Tan, from his like Peng and from you, Dr. Stephen, uh, and, and I hope the audience like it as well. Okay, thanks for three of the panelists uh, for this uh, insightful discussion. We have come to the end of this session. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is absolute my honor as well as a privilege to have you all here. A few people in the background, the student service team, thank you so much, and you know, who have done an excellent job, so thank you. And uh, this is for everyone. And so thank you and grateful for you to make time for this. And for you, um, for you know everyone to just forth and to do this work. So thank you all and take care of yourself. Take time when you are exhausted, when things happen that you didn't expect. So thank you all. ISO Plaza series organized by Integrated Sustainability and um, Urban Creativity Center from Asia Pacific University and Technology and Innovation APU. Till then, take care and each other. Have a wonderful evening. I see you soon. And for the Malaysian audience, happy National Day. <laughs>